Hello, I'm Charles Clausen, your host of the Ampex Podcast, a show where we engage in conversations with entrepreneurs and innovators whose wild ideas and exponential thinking are reshaping the universe where we live, play, and work. I believe these powerful conversations will inspire you to pursue your dreams. Jeff, I've been looking forward to this interview. Um, everything we wanted to know about rowing and didn't know. So it's, um, it's exciting. I um, was looking at your bio and I noticed that when you were younger in your career, you were a coach in Ocean City, New Jersey. Yep. Yeah. The high school team. Yeah. Tell yeah. me about that. I have a long history of the beach in Ocean City, oh, New Jersey. So you really, okay. <laughs> so, um, I grew up about a block from the ocean. I grew up in a small town, Ventnor, New Jersey, which is just, um, you know, the next town over from Atlantic city, you know, kind of in the middle ocean city, Atlantic city. And, um, my father, he was a lifeguard and the lifeguards every summer on Friday evenings, they have rowing and swimming competitions between the different cities. Right. So I grew up watching my dad row and my dad, uh, he didn't row collegiately, but he rode on the life in the lifeguard races. And, um, he was a part of this starting this Viking rowing club down at the Jersey Shore, which which then spawned into um, Holy Spirit High School and Atlantic City High School, where I went. They were the they were the first two uh, rowing high schools in South Jersey, um, and that's that's how the rowing kind of was born. There was a, a young man, or at the time he was a young man by the name of Bill Subin, who was from the area, and he went to Dartmouth College. And he came home, he was the coxswain, the, the smaller athlete that steers the boat. Right. And he gathered up the rowing champions from the four towns on the island that Atlantic City is on. And he, he had a, a famous collegiate coach, Tom Bear Kern in Philadelphia, who summered in Margate, New Jersey, which was on the island. And uh, he coached these eight, these eight guys and they went up and they won the Philadelphia Independence Day Regatta, which, was, which is and, and was one of the bigger summer regattas in the Philadelphia area. So that's that's how rowing started. Uh, I grew up, my dad then started coaching. He coached at Holy Spirit High School. He coached at Atlantic City High School. And my three brothers and I, all four of us rode for him, rode in college. Um, and then I was I went to school to be a, an elementary school teacher. Right. Um, prior to that, I worked at a boarding school where I was the rowing coach and, the, and I, I did some some work in the resident life office, became the dean or you know director of, of residential life uh, at the Hunt School in Princeton and just uh, went back to South Jersey after my wife and I had our son and uh, actually started the program in Ocean City because I was an Ocean City lifeguard. And um, they, they wanted to start a rowing program and I was approached to, if I was interested in helping to start that and did that for, I guess, five years or so and then um what, what years were you a lifeguard in ocean city um i was a lifeguard in ocean city i started lifeguarding in atlantic city did a, a brief stint in ventnor and then finished in ocean city i was there from uh the summer of 93 till 2013. so i did a 20-year strength span in uh in ocean city when i was became you know moved up the rank senior guard lieutenant senior lieutenant things like that and then I had this opportunity to coach collegiately, which has always kind of been my dream, and I had to give up my lifeguard, my lifeguard dream to, to follow my, <laughs> my coaching dream. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure I had a number of summers on the beach in Ocean City with my kids when you were a lifeguard sure. there. Where, where was your house? Where would you go? Well, we would rent different houses along the boardwalk. Okay. Um, so usually on the north end of the, the island, up around the gardens. Yeah. Um, there's browns which is yeah. same it's browns donuts. donuts and absolutely uh, um so yeah i probably spent dozen summers right with my kids up there so i have many now nah, it's a great place it was a uh, memory it you know my I, my wife and i talk about it all the time how lucky my brothers and i were like you don't think about it at the time but to grow up in the area where people go for vacation you kind of take a lot for granted in in the area and and you know, being able to, you know, walk to the beach every day and see the ocean and things. And now that I live out here in, in <laughs> Iowa, you know, the, those things, you know, you, those are the things you miss, the, the proximity to the, to the beach. And exactly. Well, we, we would make the trek from Iowa out to Ocean City. Not an easy drive. No. And my in-laws lived in uh, the King of Prussia, Paoli sure. area. So I drove by these you know, along the Schuylkill and Boat Boathouse Lane with all yep. the row houses and all the 
the yeah. crews out there on the on the river. So I've you know I've watched them for decades. Yeah. yeah no, I I grew like so. If you rode at the Jersey Shore, you know, in the time period that I did, every weekend we would trailer our boats up from the back bays to the Schuylkill. So you know, the Schuylkill to me. From the time I can remember, I was in a car driving up with my mom and dad to watch rowing races on the Schuylkill, and then eventually I got to race, and then eventually I got to row at Temple University on the Schuylkill, um, and then you know prior to coming back here to Iowa, I had about a 15-month stay at LaSalle University, and I was right on Boathouse Row, and it was uh, kind of like a full circle moment for me, you know, to be able to to be back where it all began for me before I was you know fortunate enough to be asked to come. You know, man, this position. Right. So I, um, uh, I understand that collegiate ro- rowing. The first match was between Harvard and Yale back in the eight late eighteen fifty two. Eighteen fifty two. Not even the late eighteen hundreds. Yeah. So it's it's a got a rich tradition. Yeah, and it's actually that was the first intercollegiate sporting event. So there was that was the first one between any when two colleges got together to do anything in America. So. Uh, the roots of rowing are, are strong, for sure. So, b- before coming to Iowa, you were assistant rowing coach in Miami. How did how yeah. did you come from Miami to Iowa? That's a big shift. Year that, round, nice weather. Yeah, too. and that, it, it was. Uh, I like to, to joke that it, how how brief my stint was at Miami. It was all totaled. I was only an employee there for one month. Um, and what had happened was the previous coach Andrew Carter, who who was at Iowa as the head coach when I was the assistant here, he hired me as his assistant at Miami. And, you know, I started recruiting activities for the month of July that year. And a few months, a few weeks into the month, he told me that Iowa contacted him and he got interviewed to come out and get the head job here and that he was going to take it. And he wanted me to come with him. Ah, so you followed the boss. (laughs) So I followed him. Yeah. Uh, So like I said, I, Briefly, I worked at Miami. I mean, I did I did collect one paycheck from them, so I can say that I was an employee. Oh, but, wow. But I didn't get to coach much there. Well, I was um, looking back over um, kind of Iowa's traditions, and it looked like back in 2017, 18, and 19, the um, women's rowing team was doing real well. I think in 2018, you were fourth in the Big Ten championships mm-hmm. and 11th in the nation. Yeah, we uh, we had a really good run in that those three year period. Um, we were fortunate to have some some great athletes come through the program at that time. Um, Iowa, you know, as everybody knows, is not known. You know, the state of Iowa for many water sports. No. Um, so you know, rowing, it, all of the things that you need to be a successful Division One rowing program are here mm-hmm. from facilities. I mean, the Beckwith Boathouse is, is second to none. It's, it's a world-class facility with the indoor rowing tanks so that we can, tr- you know, train year-round at speed. We have, you know, over 40 ergometers. We have state-of-the-art boats. You, everything that you need is there. Um, it's just getting the word out that Iowa, you know, has these things. And, you know, when I, when I got here in, in the year, uh, I think it was 13, 14 season, I was the recruiter and, and you know, as the recruiter, you have to figure out the puzzle, you know, because um, one of the things that I really enjoy is on the recruiting trails, you run into coaches and friends right. from other universities. And, you know, there are certain schools that you'll look at and you'll say, man, they have it all figured out. It must be so easy to recruit there. And then you sit down over a cup of coffee and you hear what their challenges are. And, like, you know, everybody has a challenge, um, but everybody also has a hook and everybody else has, um, you know, their major selling point. And, you know, for Iowa, it is the, the opportunity to be a Hawkeye. You know, I, I talk a lot uh, to our athletes that, you know, there's 30,000 students, you know, graduate and undergraduate at the University of Iowa, but there's only 650 Hawkeyes who get to put on the black and gold and they get to go out and they get to compete and represent the university and the state and, and everybody. So with that, that's a very special thing. You know, that was ob- I mean, very evident to me the day I walked in the door here, you know, you, you go into the the gas station and there's Iowa gear. You go to the sporting goods store, there's Iowa gear. You, right. You can get it at the everywhere. And uh, fandom is is second to none none here. And I you know I talked a lot with the, the coach at the time and I said, listen, you know, rowing is traditionally a late entry sport. You know, all over the world, most people get into it in college. Most people don't get into it in high school or before. I mean, you're not going to see many 
five and six year olds carrying a 55 foot long boat and 12 foot oars, <laughs> you know? Um, so it start, you start in college and being a big, big 10 university, the big 10 schools really have like set the blueprint for how to do it. You know, you're, there, there's a bunch of high level rowers that are rowing in high school and you know, you try to recruit them the best that you can, but everybody's doing it right. Everybody, you're not going to be able to beat everybody out and getting those athletes. So we recruit a little bit internationally. If you look at our roster, you see we have some, some athletes from, from all over the world, a couple from New Zealand, a couple from England, a couple from Canada, South Africa, um, you know, a girl from Ireland. We've had people from Italy, the Netherlands, uh, Serbia, and we go and we find those rowers, but the backbone to our program are what we call our homegrown Hawkeyes, who are athletes that we now actively recruit out of high school, taller athletes, um, powerful at athletes, Condition, like well conditioned aerobic so they don't athletes. have to have no rowing background they no. just have to have the physique and the desire yeah, and the no, rowing, no rowing background just kind of, again the you know the, the physical attributes but you know that that mental attribute of being able to grind and work hard which you know the people of Iowa aren't afraid to roll their sleeves up and get to work so we find a lot of great women that way you know one of one of our top rowers that's ever come through the program Hunter Koningsfeld um, she she was uh, from Cedar Rapids, Jefferson. She was a cross country athlete. She was about six foot two. You know, she decided, you know, she had some, some different injuries and things like that that did, weren't allowing her to perform and running the way she wanted to. Right. So she came to my office and she said, you think I'd be a rower? And I'm like, absolutely. And she is, to me, she's the ultimate success story with how it works because in 18 months, she went from walking through my door asking to be a rower to making the under 23 national team and winning a bronze medal uh, at the world championships. So like, she was like zero experience to a hero. Like I said, in about 18 months to two years time. And, um, so it can happen as long as you have that right mindset, physical attributes, and, you know, not, a, not afraid to grind and, and get <clears throat> Do after swimmers it. make good rowers. Swimmers make good rowers. You know, we, we like to tell them we, uh, uh, Evan Schwickerath is uh, a young woman coming here from Waukee. They just won the state championships for women here in Iowa. She'll be coming. Um, and, you know, I joke with her and the other women who swim on, who have been, you know, swimmers. We say, look, we're going to let you breathe whenever you want. You can actually like see where you're going, you know, and be on top of the water for a little bit. <laughs> so uh, swimmers make good ones because, as you know, as a former swimmer, um, there's a whole lot of prep work for, you know, I don't know what your event was, but, you know, hopefully less than two minutes of swimming, right? So Yeah, well, mine was usually less than 30 seconds. I, 20 seconds. I was right. a sprinter, sprint right. freestyler. So two laps, the pool all out. So yeah, short and fast. Sure. So how does Iowa, I know back in the um, 17, 2017 through 19, you were um, in the top 12 in the country, but how, do, how does Iowa year in and year out stack out in the conference? Yeah, so... Uh, the best we've ever done at the Big Ten uh, Championships is fourth as a team. Last year we finished fifth. Uh, the year prior to me getting here, we were seventh overall. Only eight teams in the Big Ten have women's rowing, uh, to put that in perspective. Um, but we're usually, you know, I would say historically we have been in that sixth and seventh. And then, and then during that run, we were in the top four or five, uh, which puts you in really good company nationally. The Big Ten is one of the most competitive, is not the most competitive conference, believe it or not, in, in women's rowing. So there was one year in that run where historically you get, uh, you get an automatic qualifier who is your champion that goes to the NCAA championships. Right. Um, and historically, the faster conferences might get two additional at-large teams to go. So three is kind of the limit. But one year, the Big Ten actually qualified six teams to the NCAA wow. championship. And that's, that's out of 22 teams that go. That's pretty amazing yeah. to get six out of 22. Yeah, so it's, it's a great conference to be in. You know exactly how fast you are nationally every time we line up with our Big Ten foes. And um, like I said, it was, it was a really good combination in that, that 17, 18, 19 window of, um, you know, any coach that tells you otherwise – there's a little bit of luck involved with recruiting. Like, you know, you got to be at the right place at the right time to meet the athletes that are going to come and, and be a part of what you're doing. You know, like, like as a coach, you do the same thing pretty much, right? You have your ideas for how to train and right. technique and things of that nature. But the athletes are what really makes it happen. And we were really fortunate to have a great group right there. Um, I think we have an exceptional group on our roster right now that are poised to do some, some really incredible things this year. 
Um, so, so stay tuned. We'll see. We'll see so, how did you goes. come by that beautiful boathouse? I just it, uh, all of a sudden it showed up. Yeah, and it, it looks. I haven't been inside of it, but it looks awful impressive. And the way you talked about it, it's right up there with the best. Yeah, I'd love to, to give you a tour sometime uh, and, and definitely see it up up close and personal. So, again. Um, the stars have to align for a lot of the great things to happen in the world, right? I think, you know, right. as you get older, you start to realize <laughs> that there are, there's always a little bit of luck in everything that happens. And so, so Dr. Beckwith, who was a, you know, a basketball player here, I believe in the late, in, in the eighties, mm -hmm. um, she was, you know, asked to, well, not really asked, there was a campaign to try and come up with a boathouse for the women's rowing team, because when the athletic departments merged, you know, there was a lot of facilities for women's athletics that needed to kind of be upgraded because of, you know, being behind from where they needed to be from, you know, when they started in, in 73, right. I believe, right? So um, they had a campaign and they said, we need a boathouse. We have a women's rowing team. We need a boathouse to house them. Because at the time, from what I've been told, they were rowing out of, at first, an abandoned home that was on the grounds of where the boathouse is now. And, you know, they would... You know, original, the original team would snake the boat in and out of this abandoned house. And then eventually the university became, you know, it wasn't a club anymore. It became a sanctioned varsity sport. Right. Then they started rowing out of an old uh, carpenter's kind of shed on campus down by where Catlett Dormitory is now. There's like a brown copper building. Uh -huh. They rowed out of there for a little while. And then eventually they said, well, they need a permanent home, right? They, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And, you know, as Iowa always does, uh, we had some great alumni support and community support to build this boathouse and Dr. Beckwith stood up stood, stood up for it and she was kind of the champion because she had you know moved to Des Moines and was a, a doctor out in Des Moines uh -huh. but she had joined the Des Moines Rowing Club so she had had a, like a newfound love for the sport of rowing and she stepped up to help us out and you know we have a community component of the boathouse and um, that made all it all possible so we got lucky again because had Dr. Beckwith not you know decided to be a, a recreational rower who knows where we'd be rowing out of now right it's um um a beautiful facility is there collegiate men's rowing there is it's you know again that was the original one harvard and yale um it's not as you know uh predominant there's not as many varsity division one teams as there are on the women's side um unfortunately athletic departments you know over the years, they have to make decisions financially how they're going to allocate funds for men's teams and women's teams and things like that. And, right. um, there was an opportunity, I'm going to say, in the early to mid 90s when women's rowing became sanctioned by the NCAA, where the men's association was approached. The men's association is the IRA, it's the Intercollegiate Rowing Association, and they that's the original network of college rowing that started with Harvard and Yale and expanded to the Ivies and Temple or you know Syracuse and Northeastern and, and Naval Academy and the different big right. rowing powers out there um, and Cal and Washington on the West Coast and they they pretty much said you know we're 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 good we don't need to go to the NCA we have this association that's been around since with eight, rich history yeah and tradition they're like we're good we we don't need the NCAA and um, with that you know athletic departments had to make decisions and you know if you're not an NCAA sanctioned sport then. It makes it difficult for a university to say, well, we're going to give you support. You know, there are still some of the, like I said, the Ivies all still have it. Right. Um, out East Temple, where I went, has it. Drexel University, St. Joe's University in Philadelphia have it. LaSalle, where I was. Um, Naval Academy has it. Uh, Wisconsin is, is a predominant team. Um, and then Cal, Washington, Stanford out West. Um, and there's others that I'm forgetting, but they're kind of the big names in the sport still right it's um as being a swimmer we we waited for probably 30 years to get the new natatorium built right and they finally built that beautiful facility yeah and um next thing you know a couple two three years ago they eliminated men's swimming in iowa they still have the women's program but mm -hmm. i guess they have to make budget choices yeah, and you know, it's, it's think, not easy <laughs> no look i think it's it's a hard decision for every university they're faced with and i think in the changing landscape of college athletics today um you know there there's there's so many things that we are now allowed to provide for student athletes that we weren't allowed to provide before you know we have you know it started about five years ago we're able to provide um i'll, I'll call them 
refueling stations are like, they're basically snacks for pre-workout, post-workout, and our nutritionist works with the athletes so they understand how to fuel their body correctly before and after workouts. Right. So we start, we were able to do that. And, and now it's gotten to the point where, you know, this year, our women's uh, rowing team, we, we have five to six meals a week that we have planned out for them where after they lift weights in the morning, we have breakfast for them. Uh, after we have practice on Thursday afternoons and evenings, we have a, a catered dinner for them. Um, and then uh, um, and one day a week, they get what's called a black card, which is there's about 25 or 30 restaurants in town right. that give the athletes all $20 credit to go in and, and get a meal at the restaurant. So, um, you know, universities now, you have to fund that program. You have to fund the, the extra <laughs> right. refueling stations. You know, we now have what's called the Hawkeye Academic Advantage Program, or HAP, which is a result of the Alston case where the Supreme Court says that um, universities are allowed to provide uh, academic, you know, incentives or, or academic bonus. I'm not sure the exact term for, for how it was worded, but uh, they came up with the, the, ter- the, the fee of uh, $5,980. So $5,980 is the number that they said a uh, student athlete in good st- academic standing should be rewarded for their academic, you know, abilities. So that just started this year. And, and also, if they have a certain grade point, they get paid the fifty yeah. nine hundred dollars. Yeah. So and now and now every univer- the NCAA has allowed us to do this. They said, okay, you can do this, and the Supreme Court said you can do this. But there's been no real guidelines on how a university should do this. So every university is doing it differently. Some universities. Um, you know, the minute the kid walks through the door and they register in the fall semester, they get a check for $5,980. Um, some universities like Iowa, we're doing it where you'll get um, half the money each year. We'll, you'll so whatever half of 5980 is 2990 I believe. And what happens with that 2990 is, um, or 20, whatever the number, yep. I'm sorry about messing up the math. Yeah, no but, worries. But, um, but what they'll do is, um, after the first semester, they get half of the money. And then in the summer, after the second semester, they get, or I'm sorry, 25% of the money. And then half goes into a graduation account. So that when they graduate, half of the 5980 is waiting for them each year that they're on the team. So, you know, roughly $12,000 when they graduate for, for hitting their, their grades. Well, that's not, well, that's not bad, Jeff, but what about the, the women that need the money to pay their tuition? Well, we have scholarships. We have 20 uh, Do fully, you give full rides? We have 20 fully funded scholarships. We're what's called an equivalency sport. We're not a headcount sport, so that's the difference. So um, in, in the world of you know, high school athletics, everybody thinks that if you get a scholarship, everyone's getting 100%. But that's, that's not true except in sports. Like football is, is what we call a headcount. Um, gymnastics is a headcount. Volleyball is a headcount and men's and women's basketball. I thought they could split up scholarships and give take a uh, basketball scholarship and give it to two players, give them each a half. Those one. sports can't do that. They have to give full scholarships. Oh. Um, every other sport, you know, baseball, track, s- swimming, rowing, field hockey, soccer, we're all equivalency sports. So we are all sitting there figuring out, you know, how do we maximize scholarship money to get as many quality athletes in as we can and then at the same time, you want to kind of reward everybody that you can. But so it's a, it's a constant battle, you know, like we, we have 75 women is what our goal is to have on our roster. So to try to have 20 scholarships divvied up among 75 is pretty hard. So we do have some athletes on full scholarship. We have some athletes on, you know, 75, 50, Then, then obviously a bunch of walk-ons. Then we have a bunch of walk-ons, you know, and uh, we actually use... Uh, we allocate currently one scholarship I dedicate to getting our, our walk-ons to come. So, I, you know, if they're, if they're willing to take a chance on coming to Iowa and be a rower and give up volleyball or basketball or right. whatever they did, I want to show them that I'm serious about it. Like, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be a situation where I'm like, yeah, 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 come to Iowa. You'll love it. Like, I want them to know that, that I'm, I'm backing what, what I'm saying, that they would be a good rower. Wow, 75, 75 athletes. So in a, in a, in a rowing competition, um, between all the different lengths and the different boat sizes, how many, how many people compete Sure. So in, a, in an event? Or so match? to 75 seems like 
an outrageous number, right? A lot of people uh, will will question. Well, why are you doing that? You're, you know, they'll they'll say you're you're inflating your numbers just so that you know you can be a Title IX balancing sport, which, you know, we are a Title IX balancing sport, but in reality, women's rowing at the Big Ten Championship, 51 women will compete for a Big Ten Championship. In that, we'll have our first varsity eight, our second varsity eight. So there's 18 athletes there because there's nine in a boat. Yeah. We have three varsity fours, which is another 15 athletes because there's four women rowing in each boat and, a, and another coxswain who's the, you know, you know the, the captain, so right. to speak, of the boat. And then we have two boats, which is it's a category called novice, first novice and second novice. Um, it's women who we call our, that's our first year squad. They're the women that we find on campus. They're the women that we recruit from Iowa to come here. And, you know, we're unique in that that's their opportunity to go against other women who are in their first year of collegiate rowing and they get to compete for a Big Ten championship, just like women who have oh, been rowing for eight years. That's very cool. So that, but then the complicated piece of it is the NCAA championship is only a 20 person roster or a 23 person roster because you only bring your first eight, your second eight, and your first varsity four. They go to, like if you qualify for NCAA championships, you only bring those three boats. So it's, it's a balancing act, right? Like you're trying to make the NCAA championship, but you're trying to grow a team of 51 athletes. Wow. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting day every day when you get to the boathouse to work out for sure. I bet, I bet. So Iowa City is a um, kind of a creative community um, there's a lot of innovation. We've got the Writers Workshop. Uh, we've got the Grant Wood Colony community of mm -hmm. all these fellowships that um, various artists, performers get. And they're then, you know, one of the largest medical teaching colleges in the country. Sure. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time, Jeff, talking about the women that come here and the role that rowing plays mm -hmm. i'm assuming that you have a lot of very intelligent student athletes that are equally concerned about their education sure. and finding creative cre creativity in other ways can you talk a little bit about that and sure you know, how you how the program helps mold and develop women to be well-rounded and to go out and make a big impact in the world when they leave absolutely that's uh that's actually for me not the most important important piece of the job. Um, you know, when I was a younger man, first, you know, right out of college, 1995, when I started coaching, um, you know, at the Hunt School in Princeton, which uh, I learned so much in those first couple of years as a coach, because, you know, I grew up the son of a coach and I, you know, watched my dad for years do his thing. My mom was a guidance counselor. I would watch her do her things. And, you know, you try to take lessons and remember how they, you know, would treat their athletes. and. When you're a young coach, you're just worried about winning. And you think, well, <laughs> it, it, in, yeah. order, in order to win, I need to work them hard. And, you know, you need to do this. And you, need to, and, and you, you learn gradually that um, there's more to it. It's not just we're going to outwork everybody. You know, you have to, you have to be creative with how you, you deal with the athletes. Because, you know, again, now I, you know, I started coaching 20 kids at my first program. And now I have 75 kids here at Iowa, many different personalities, many different backgrounds, many different ideas um, about everything in the world. And you have to kind of mold that into one cohesive unit. And, you know, uh, in this 50th year of Title IX, you know, I like to kind of say there is no better sport to show as an example of what Title IX has done for women than rowing. I know that there are lots of other women's sports out there that are doing amazing incredible things and it's, that's not to slight any of those things right but i actually have an opportunity to find women right you know i've had in my coaching career women that we brought to iowa who were first generation college students they were athletic they never thought they were going to go to college they they grew up on a farm they thought that that's what their life was going to be they came to one of our learn to row clinics they're like this sport seems kind of interesting we, we brought them in for a visit they met these other women and then all of a sudden, college became a reality for them. And they came and they did it and they graduated and they're the first person in their, their family to get a college degree and it's from one of the best universities in America, you know, a Big Ten University, University of Iowa. So, right. so to be able to say, we've done that for one, right? Who's the next one? 
who's the next one that we create that opportunity to, to get the education, to get the experiences. Every year, we have some young woman on our team where it's their first time getting on an airplane, right? Which blows my mind, the amount of times I've been on a plane <laughs> flying all over the place with this sport, recruiting and, and, and competing and things like that. But we have a young woman who doesn't know how to go to, through TSA. Well, what do I, well, I have to dump my water, I have to do this, I have to, you know, and like, you know, uh, another one of my, you know, I have two really fond memories were from the, you know, the, the, the non-coaching part of it, the, the personal part of it, where I had a young woman from Southeast Polk High School. We were flying to Boston for the head of the Charles Regatta, and, uh, which is one of the biggest, you know, races in America. And we're flying out, we come out over the Atlantic Ocean, we're getting ready to land in Logan, which, you know, again, I've done a, a few times and um, grow, growing up, you know, a block from the ocean, I'm just trying to finish the movie before we land. <laughs> and she's like elbowing me, coach, coach, coach. And I was like, what, what, what is it? She's like, is that the ocean? I'm like, yeah, it's the ocean. What do you think it is? <laughs> and she's like, coach, I've never seen the ocean before. It's the first time I've ever seen the ocean. And like it hits you and you're like, again, opportunity. We're, we're educating them in ways outside of the classroom now. And then, you know, we, we were um, fortunate to take, you know, 20 athletes or yeah, about 20 athletes one year. We went over to Henley Royal Regatta, which is the oldest, row, you know, one of the oldest rowing and most prestigious rowing races in the world. It's, it, you know, it's the Kentucky Derby meets rowing it's it's head-to-head -head racing it's it's in henley england it's 155 plus years old everyone has to dress up in coats and ties women have to wear dresses past their knee it's like <clears throat> time has stood still still there you know um and we get to take these women who grew up you know on a hog farm in Kelowna, iowa <laughs> and they're walking and they're rubbing elbows with with some of the you know wealthiest people in the world so it creates opportunity it creates you know through sport and then, you know, the sporting piece of it, um, I get an opportunity every day to take a young woman or a group of young women and make them do more than they thought that they could do, to give them a goal. You know, one of the things I like to do is, you know, every day there's a goal. Here's the goal for the workout. How close to that goal did you get? And, you know, I like to uh, talk a little bit about creating a safe environment at the boathouse to fail. Right? right, you know, Kobe Bryant has his kind of famous talk about that. There's no such thing as failure. Failure is when you don't get up the next day and try to try again. Right, so if you go and you don't hit your goal for the day, but you realize, okay, well, this is why I didn't hit my goal, and then you know that's Monday, Tuesday, you wake up and you try it again and you get a little bit closer. All right, well, how, what do I have to do to get a little bit closer on Wednesday? And you set those little goals up for them, and you see those growth moments, and then pretty soon you know, they get to a point where they're fearless. And we, we have a special day of the week, which is Fearless Friday. And on Friday, we, it's, it's probably one of the most challenging workouts of the week, no matter what the workout is. And I'm like, you know, we go big, like whatever your split, you know, your goal split is on the rowing machine, I want you to go a little bit faster. And I want you to go a little bit faster as long as you can. And if you, if you bonk and you're not feeling too good and you can't finish the workout, that's okay. Let's figure out why. And, um, I think teaching them how to set those goals, teaching them success, feeling that, you know, filling them with confidence, um, and then teaching them that like the sky's the limit. Don't ever hold yourself back. Um, you know, I, I joke a lot with them about that like I'm not creating rowers, I'm creating ass kickers. And my job, you know, <laughs> I, you know, again, looking back to that 25 year old me that started coaching, now that I'm, you know, 51 years old, I say, listen, uh, create ass kickers, create championship people, right? What are, the, what are the qualities of successful people that we can bring into what we're doing as rowers? And then they're successful in the classroom, they're successful in the boat. And then for me, the, 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 the best part of this job is when someone that you coach five, 10, 15 years ago, you know, they text you with a picture of their baby or they tell you they got a promotion or they, hey, this, this story that you told me was bobbling around in my head and, and helped me through a hard time. Like, that's what this is really about. You know, um, I'm a glorified phys ed teacher, right? Like back when college athletics started, they were all phys ed teachers. And, um, you know, I, my, my roots as a school teacher run deep in me. My, you know, like I said, my mom's guidance counselor background, my dad's coaching background. Like, I, I really take that interpersonal side of it serious because you build those relationships, they trust you, They'll do whatever you ask them to do. You know, there are 
there are coaches, I think through history that have been successful who athletes feared, right? And, and they were afraid of that coach. So they right. worked at a certain level. I feel like in this day and age, the, the kind of coach that I try to be is I want them to be afraid of disappointing me rather than afraid of me because I'm afraid of disappointing them every day. Every day I go to the boathouse, I try to give them the best that I can give them so that I know when I go home, I didn't let anybody down. And like, that's kind of the relationship. Like I'm never, I'm always going to have your back. I'm never going to let you down. You do the same for me. And then we're going to have success in life, water, classroom, right. you name it. Well, I mean, I think the, the empowerment and giving them the confidence to mm -hmm. show up and go all out. I know, um, in, in swimming, especially sprint sw swimming, you know, now they're, they're doing two laps of the pool in 18 and a half seconds or so. Yeah. Um, it's all mindset. It is all mindset. So I was, I was never the th Yeah. I was one of the more slower guys in practice, but you know, being six, six and 215 pounds, I got a lot to pull through the water. But when I had to swim a couple laps of the pool, I could go really fast for short bursts of speed, but it's all about mindset and just total focus and total concentration and not letting what, I mean, I don't know how rowers intimidate each other in their boats, but I'm sure they have little things where they try to get in, uh, yeah. in people's minds. And, and I mean, it's, it's a racing sport. So you're familiar with that. You know, um, what's, what's another of your like, unique piece of the sport of rowing is that, um, you know, there's the book, the boys in the boat, which, you know, is, uh, really popular. George Clooney's making a movie about it right now. Um, and it's the story of, of, uh, Joe Rance, who was a 1936 Olympian, they went to Germany, they won the gold medal, but it was a group of guys who learned how to row from their freshman year on at the University of Washington. And, you know, the, it's great for the sport of rowing because now so many people have read this book, uh -huh. but, but like the amount of people now that are like, oh, rowing, it's just like boys in a boat, right? And, and you know, it is um, in that the one thing that hasn't changed with the sport is you have to, as a coach, take eight individuals and make them one, you know, because there are laws of physics that come into play with a boat moving and moving objects. And, you know, Sir Isaac Newton had all his theories. And, you know, the more in unison that the crew moves, the faster the boat's going to be able to go. So uh, George Pocock, who uh, is a famous character, he was kind of like the boat builder for the, the Washington team. And he was an old rower and rowing coach and things like that. He came from Eton College in England, and he was in the coach's ear, kind of like his little voice of reason and you know his uh, his mentor. He said, "What you're trying to do in a rowing race is uh, take eight athletes, and if you put it in the world in terms of golf, to get eight golfers to swing a golf club at the exact same time, same speed, hit." all eight golf balls at the same time and have all those eight golf balls land in the uh, in a hula hoop. That's that's what we're trying to do as rowing coaches. So, you know, we have women uh, different heights and body types and lengths of arms and legs and things like that. So you're, um, you know, you're constantly trying to blend it all together so that there's this perfect swing within the crew, perfect movement up and down the slide. And then you have the oar and you want to try and make sure that all of their blades are squaring and feathering and catching the water at the same time and releasing the water at the same time. So like on race day, I talk a lot to them about the, the most frustrating piece of rowing is that you physically can't do anything to stop your opponent, right? Like, so any of them that come from a, another sport, you know, if it's basketball and I need to shut somebody down, I'm going to put my best player on them and they're going to shut them down. But in right. rowing, we have to kind of focus on us more. We have to focus on our uni uni unisense a little bit more, our ability to stay together more. And then um, if we're able to do that, the boat goes fast. So we're constantly trying to slow the boat down less by doing everything together more. Well, that's, that's interesting. So this is um, called the Ampex Podcast. Visitor here. Um, so the history behind AMPX is that AMP stands for amplitude, and I'm thinking of uh, the human brainwave. So the more focused 
and the more present you are, the higher the brainwave gets. But when you look at high performance teams like Navy SEALs and other mm -hmm. high performing athletic teams or um, teams where people work together a lot, they get to the point where they do without thinking. You don't have to think. And as that amplitude of the team come, gets higher, they're kind of in sync with each other. Yeah. And they're, they're actually doing without doing. They're not really thinking about it. You know, uh, um, Yo-Yo Ma or, you know, great um, ballerinas when they perform, they're not thinking about what they're going to do. They're just being and they're totally present in the moment. Then sure. those heightened levels of performance come through. So in, in rowing, you've got eight people that have to be in total sync going all out. And um, yeah. I, I'm sure things happen like a little wave catches a paddle and, um, you know, then Absolutely. they just have to get back in sync. And, and not then there's let the, it, the coxswain, who's the ninth member of the crew, who's actually steering the boat. They have a race plan that we've developed for the team based on their, you know, physical prop, you know, fitness and prowess and, and what we're, our strengths are. Um, you know, they they're an integral part of it, too, because they kind of keep the athletes calm. They, they're the ones who kind of dictate what the rhythm's going to be. And they talk to the crew and they're constantly giving them little calls, you know, to motivate them and the calls to calm them down because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to burn out too much. It's a six and a half, hopefully less minute race so the, so the coxswain's actually sometimes sensing that they're they're putting out too much yeah, effort they, and they're saying you know back off a little bit yep they, they have an onboard computer that's, that's run by gps that tells us you know what our split is so kind of like your your rowers that you guys use at orange theory it tells you your pace oh so they we know have, how they know where how they are against the plan yep. based on the, the exact time and, the, and they'll know you know most of our races are on flat water lakes so it's it's pretty reliable the GPS that you're, you're picking up. It's, you know, it's a little bit different on the Iowa river because up, up, up river, up river and down river is a little different. Um, but on, you know, race course where like we'll, we'll be racing in New Jersey for our first race, you know, in March, um, they'll, they'll know exactly how fast they're going. We'll, we'll have an idea from training what we should be going and, um, they'll tell them how many strokes a minute they're going. They'll tell them how fast we're going. They'll be able to tell them how far into the race they are so that the athletes can kind of just get into that rhythm and focus on the person in front of them and, and do their job. So when you think about a, a race plan, um, are, are those plans that just kind of tweak as the team progresses through the season or do you make big shifts? And yeah, it, it's, um, it depends on who crew, who the crew is, right? Because, um, you know, some crews, they might be a bigger, more physically imposing crew. So, they might be able to, you know, get off the line faster, right? So if they get off the line faster, they get a little bit of lead, then they're going to shift into a little bit lower cadence and they're going to try and conserve energy and keep that power. Um, sometimes you have an a, a group of athletes that maybe aren't as powerful, but they're really aerobically fit. So you say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to go out harder, longer, and we're going to try and get a lead. And then we're going to use our endurance to hold the lead, you know, mm -hmm. because we might not be able to, match power with a certain crew, but we might be able to out endurance them. So let's use that as a strategy. Um, and then, you know, the beginning of the race is going to be a few shorter strokes to get the, the boat up to momentum and up to speed. Uh -huh. And then you're going to, you know, maybe 15, 20 really high strokes, you know, 45 strokes a minute. And then you're going to shift down into like a base cadence. Some schools, 38, 36 to 38 strokes a minute. Other schools, you know, there's a couple that are 38, maybe closer to 40 strokes a minute, and they're going to row that race all the way through until about the last 250, last, you know, 30 strokes of the race where the coxswain's going to make a call. Okay, let's bring the rating up and let's try to sprint to the finish line and get by this crew or hold this crew off. And then it changes throughout the year. It depends on who you're racing. You know, you might, you might know like, hey, this crew's really fast off the line, so we have to be a little bit more focused in our start or, Hey, we're going to go off the line ahead of this team. So let's conserve energy a little bit for the, for the finish or whatever it is. Do, do you ever try to just match the other team? If you have a real powerful team that finishes strong and just wait until the last 75 yards and go all out and try to leave them behind. I mean, yeah. I mean, that, that could be a, a strategy as well. But, um, you know, one of the things that we really were focused on last year was each week we just had a goal time. I'm like, Hey, best based on these conditions, this is kind of what the time is we're trying to go for. Let's just row the fastest race that we can row. 
you know, we really, last year in my first year, focused on that, being mindful <laughs> about our crew and our crew only, because if we're all together, eight minds unified, being, you know, being led by our coxswain, we're going to be the fastest that we can be. Let's just be the fastest we can be, and we'll see what, where that. Oh, yeah, that's a good strategy. If you're always going as fast as you can, and that's, you get a little faster every time that over yeah. the course of the season. We didn't let. We didn't really let the the out. We tried to block out the outside, um, you know, influence of another crew as much as we can. Human nature takes over, right? Like you're next to somebody, you're going to go a little harder. Right. Um, but trying to get them to understand that. You, you're racing yourself. You're trying to put down your best performance. And if your best performance is fast enough, we'll beat the other crew. But right. at the end of the day, win or lose, we want to be able to get off the dock and say, okay, we rode our best race. It was good enough or it wasn't good enough. How do we, it's fine. How do we figure, how do we figure out how to get faster for the next week? You know, take, take a lesson, like I said, take a lesson from everything we do to, to learn. So how much time can a, uh, a team take off a, a race from the beginning of the year to the end? Um, as far as like... I mean, can they drop 20, 30, 40 seconds off of... I think probably 15 to 20 seconds, can, depending on the conditions, w would be, you know, probably the most you would see. Um, but usually I'd say somewhere in that 10 second range, you'll get about 10 seconds faster over the course of the year. Because there are things that, that play into it. I mean, obviously being an outside sport, the wind, was it a tailwind? Was it a headwind? Was there no wind? Um, and then something else that actually uh, you don't even think about is that um, the temperature of the water dictates how fast the boat's going because cold water is slower than hot water. So like- So the boat slices so, through it slower. Yeah, the density is a little different. So there's a little bit less surface resistance and you're able, able to go faster. So, you know, if, if we row a race in April in, in Iowa City, we're gonna be slower than when we race uh, in, in May in, in Sarasota, <coughs> Florida. So in, in swimming, um, we train really hard. I mean, it, it, during Christmas break, we'll train three times a day, for, you know, swim up to 10 miles. Then when you get towards the end, you start tapering. Is there any such thing as a taper yep. in rowing? Do you start yeah, resting the muscles when you get towards bigger meets? And it's, it's definitely still a thing. Um, you know, we're, we're at a point now where we're just trying to, you know, we're, we're transitioning from, you know, in the fall, we do a lot of our long steady rows. It's a little bit, you know, you're building that aerobic base. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you get into this time of year, you start to do some more anaerobic workouts, some shorter distance, higher cadence, more, you know, sprint type workouts. Um, and then as you get closer and closer to your championship, you're going to have less of those long steady aerobic rows you're going to have more of those anaerobic kind of rows but the the volume of pieces starts to slow down a little bit as you get closer and closer to the championship i mean uh my dad you know his his brothers and his grandfather and my grandfather they they raised horses and uh about out in jersey and uh, my dad always had a saying as a coach you know when it's the week of the championship the hay's in the barn in the barn you know the, the, <laughs> the work is done you just kind of rest in the resting the athletes trying to get ready to go keep, and just keeping their their nervous energy you just burn the nervous energy a little bit you don't want to burn anything more than right that. do you do you do um workouts during the year where they're training all where they're going all out or they might yeah. show up on a friday where they'll do two or three all out races yeah and... friday friday uh well you know last night's workout was pretty challenging uh they did a two two by six thousand meters so they went after it a little bit there they, uh, then they did uh, 30 minutes riding on a bike, and then they did another 30 minutes uh, rowing in the tanks. So that was, that was last night's workout, <clears throat> almost two hours, two hours of conditioning. Um, and then today we were at the indoor turf. We did a little bit of a run, and we did some you know, cross-training things in there. So they, they ran for 30 minutes, and then they did you know, five rounds of cross-training, like core activities. Uh, the tomorrow's, tomorrow's practice is going to be four times a race. So four times 2000 meters tomorrow, not at all out pace, but right. there'll be pieces of it. Like, so every 500 meters are gonna change their stroke rate. The rates will go up as they go. So when they get to the last 500 meters, it's gonna be at race pace. So we're, we're getting into the time of the year where higher stroke ratings, they need to start to touch those a little bit and get, get uncomfortable. And then that becomes- So, so when they're 
getting towards the end of a race. You said there they can be 38 to 42 strokes a minute. Yeah. That seems like they're screaming. Yeah, they're, they're, they, the, I think the best analogy that I've heard through the years is someone explained a rowing race. You burn the same amount of energy in one six and a half minute rowing race as playing two back to back full court basketball games. So it's, it's all <clears throat> out, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you definitely deplete all of your glycogen stores to talk science for a little bit about, you know, as, as you're in that, um, you know, three minute range, right. Is where, you know, and that's about halfway through the race. Right. So everyone talks a lot about in the third 500, that's where a lot of crews, you know, they die. That's where the, you know, the champs get away from the chumps yeah. and, um, it's, it's conditioning. It's, are you able to push through that lactic acid buildup after three minutes? Cause about three minutes is where the lactic acid is screaming in your legs uh-huh. and your lungs are burning and your arms are tired and your back is tired. And, um, that's where the coxswain really comes into play. Hey, we're halfway through the race. Let's focus second half of the race plan. Here's what we're working on. Um, trying to get them to, to think about that instead of how bad their legs hurt. So the coxswain is really important. I mean, is yeah. that typically one of the more s- senior? Yeah, it, I mean, it could be. It just really comes down to, um, you know, a, a good coxswain, in my opinion, will be able to run a Fortune 500 company. Because a good coxswain can handle a multitude of tasks being thrown at them on the fly and process them all and put them in the right order of, I need to do this, then I'll do that, then I'll get to that, then I'll get to that. And then at the same time, be able to have the outside, they're allowed to look side to side and they tell us, oh, we're ahead of this boat. This boat's starting to move back on us. We need to take a move. All right, guys, let's focus on this or this or this and let's try to stay ahead of this boat or... You know, so hey, they're they're communicating constantly. through the eyes for the whole team because yeah. people aren't allowed to be doing yeah you're looking not, left yeah, and you right sh- you shouldn't be you should be focused <laughs> on what's going on it happens human nature happens but um, hopefully you're further enough ahead that you, nobody has to look side to side they can just look straight back so out of curiosity Jeff does a coxswain train and row and do everything else they do that- there's times where there's coxswain will row on the rowing machines just to get a workout in they feel like they want you know. I believe that, you know, they work out with a team. The team has better respect for them, you know. So there's uh-huh. certain workouts they do. They go and they, they lift weights with them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And, um, you know, when we go for runs, we do, you know, like a warm-up run. They're, they do the warm-up run and the flexibility and the stretching out and all those things. So, as so much do as you have can. a strength coach for the, the rowing team? We do. We have a full-time strength coach that works with us, Cody Roberts. Uh, I can't um, say enough about him. He is – he's amazing. Um he is a you know uh, an unbelievable strength coach, but at the same time he he wants to learn. He wants to learn more about rowing. He wants to learn how he can transition what he knows as a strength coach to be as as you know beneficial as possible to the sport of rowing. So we do a lot of things that are I'm going to say I'm not you know are they're different than other teams. Uh, you know in my experience as a rower, as my experience as a coach, there are things that through the years. I know have really worked for me as an athlete right. and you know there are people who have really high sports science IQ that it can explain it better than me but I know <laughs> like from having done it and coached it there are things that we've switched up with our training to to allow us to become better athletes again I think that um, most of our kids on our team most of the student athletes on our team um, we're athletes in other sports and we recruited them because of that. So, you know, the sport of rowing gets a bad rap as being the sport where you sit on your, your backside and you just go backwards, right? Like it's how athletic is that? Well, the boat's moving side to side. There are things that are happening with balance that you need to be uh, on top of your balance to be able to apply force correctly. Um, because if you're applying force and your balance isn't good, you can potentially hurt yourself. So Cody has been great where we've, we've really developed a a program where his program in the weight room complements what we're doing on the water and everything that we're trying to do is to make our athletes as dynamic as they can be. Like, I don't want them to just be good rowers. I want them to be good athletes. I want them to be great athletes. And, um, I think using that, harnessing their natural athleticism more is allowing us to do some things that we weren't able to do when we just kind of focused on you're going to be the best at rowing the rowing machine. You know, we run, we do pull-ups, we do different strength tests. Um, 
you know, we want to kind of be well-rounded. You ever do, do yoga? Get the, we do yeah. do some yoga. We do do some yoga. Um, usually I'll have somebody else kind of work with us to do the yoga. I am not uh, the best example of how to do yoga because, you know, I'm, a, I'm as tight as a board. And um, I want them to know the right way to do it. So we'll have some, some other people will help us with the yoga and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, yoga is great for flexibility and balance. Yeah. And, you know, flexibility with strength is, is a good combination. Absolutely. So the, um, I guess the, the one thing that we missed that I wanted to talk a little bit about was gender equality. And I know you, we talked a little bit about <laughs> Title IX, but um, how far does women's Athletics need to go to catch up and be equal with men, at least on a dollar per per head count, if not yeah, in total I, uh, dollars. I mean, football kind of distorts things, but yeah, um, I, I'll say this: um, what we're being provided, you know, with women's rowing at the University of Iowa is, you know, mind-boggling. You know, when I when I've, I've talked to some of my peers. Uh, I feel like Dr. Evil right now. Uh, when I, when I um, talk to some of my peers in the Pac-12 and some other conferences that people are like, well, those must be rowing superpowers. I mean, our budgets are, are ridiculous compared to them. Like we have so many more resources than they do to provide the student athletes. I think um, in my sport, what we need to do is to just get the word out about the opportunity. And, um, you know, I need... Uh, people who are traditional rowers who are rowing all around the world to understand that the University of Iowa, you're going to get a world-class education. You're going to get a world-class rowing experience. Um, you're going to be in, I'm going to say, the quintessential American college town. I mean, I, I've been around a lot of different places and like Iowa City is so unique. You know, the, the way that the town and the university kind of just melt together and you don't really know if you know it's campus or town or whatever. It, like, there's nowhere else in in the world like it. You know, I mean, you know, obviously you, you could look at other Big Ten teams and right. and say, oh well, you know, Madison has it kind of like that, but it's different. It's a big city. It's not the same. You know, like to me, it seems like Iowa is like it's like a neighborhood. You know, it's 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 uh, it's a neighborhood in a big city, and there's there's so much going on and and so much. Uh, life to be had so to me i think for my sport people need to know how great it is here um i think for some of the other sports i don't think it's much different uh, i think that um what iowa is athletically and, and i'll say you know everyone talks a lot about like football and how we take the three-star recruit and we turn them into a five-star recruit right that's every sport at iowa Right, the majority of the kids that we get are kids that we believe in, that we see greatness in, that we think, with our influence and and the, our ability to coach, we're going to take them to where they need to be. I mean, I think um, one of my favorite coaches to watch what they do is Rick Heller and the baseball team and Marty Sutherland. Now, you know, I might be a little bit biased because they're two of my closest friends, right. but but you know, the way that Rick. And, and Marty and, and those guys teach the sport. They take kids that are, are, you know, really great athletes and turn them into really great baseball players. It's, it's the same for them. You know, they teach them the nuances of the swing and how to throw pitching. And like what they do is like space age when I went in there to watch how they teach, co you know, coach pitching. Um, but then, you know, uh, obviously you, you, you look at our, our wrestling programs, the tradition is unbelievable, but you know, hard work is what got them to where they are, right? It's not, the, the, the secret is you just work hard and you believe in your athletes and you teach them what to do. So, I mean, the easy thing to say is, yeah, well, we need more. We just need more resources, right? You know, um, I'm not complaining about mine. Like, I would never complain. Like, I am, I am so um, ecstatic about what I'm able to provide my student athletes. But in the changing landscape of college athletics now with name, image, and likeness, and the 5980, you know, the Austin money, the HAP that like we talked about earlier, um, the university's gonna need to figure out, you know, how do we increase our resources to provide these programs to the student athletes? Because, you know, it, it's becoming a little bit of an arms race, right? Because right. certain schools are gonna be able to do all of those things, right? And, and you know, um, the NCAA just came up with a, a ruling too in, in January where, there's no more volunteer coaches allowed for sports. So 
you know, for example, in rowing, there's a head coach and I have three assistant coaches right. and I'm allowed to have um, up to uh, three volunteer coaches. The new ro- rule says I'm no longer allowed to have volunteer coaches, but I'm now allowed to have up to six paid assistant coaches. Now, do, they fund, do they fund all of those well, six coaches? But, but that's the question, right? Like, how do you fund that? But at the same time, how do you fund all of the athletes getting the Alston money? How do you fund, you know, how do you, you know, what do you do when you have boosters that want to swarm or to, to contribute to the swarm and the different, you know, booster organizations that are going to help with name, image, and likeness. And like, you know, all of these things are important, but which one's the most important and which one as a university, you know, you where do you allocate those resources? You know, we're really fortunate that we are boosted and we have the TV deals and all of those things, but how, how do you decide what's the most important? Well, I mean, it sounds like there's going to be more tough choices <laughs> in the future to be made on resources and allocations and who gets what. So yeah. it's, it's not, not easy. The administrators have a tough choice. Yeah, they but do for sure. It's, um, it's great that coaches like yourself are doing such good work for all of these young women and giving them opportunities Thank and you. teaching them all these amazing mm-hmm. life skills. And when they leave Iowa and go out into the real world, I'm sure some of them someday will be CEOs. They will be. Absolutely. You know, uh, if you, if you were to, to look on LinkedIn, I think that if you go and you look at some of, uh, major corporations in America, if, if you go through their who's who in, in their corporations, you're going to find a rower somewhere. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a great sport, teaches you a lot about yourself, teaches you a lot about teamwork, hard work, goal setting, and, uh, it's changed my life. And I'm just really fortunate that I get to, to help change, hopefully change some people's lives for the good, uh, through a sport that I love and grew up doing. Well, fantastic. We're so glad you found time to talk to us today, Jeff. Um, look forward to getting it, this out there on YouTube and awesome. streaming services and tell your story and the University of Iowa rowing team story and uh, hopefully increase um, uh, the visibility. So thanks for joining us on the Ampex podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure not to miss future episodes and please rate the show wherever you get your podcast. Thanks to our awesome production team, Lindsay Soderberg, social and digital marketing, Taylor Higgins, video production, and Seth Nielsen, marketing. See you next time.